Well, thank you, Shauna. It is true we are in the middle of a sermon series called The Hall of Faith, where we are looking at some of the great key characters of the Old Testament. We find a list of these great characters in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, and we've been systematically going through them saying, what is it about these characters, these guys that have the ability to take faith and make it their own and go to battle with that? The sermon series right before this, we had been looking at Ephesians, and we didn't intend this, but the last thing that we did in that series was we looked at the armor of God. And in it, we saw that one of the pieces of armor was the shield of faith, which it says you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And as we started into this one called the hall of faith, we realized this is textbook. How do you use that shield? How do you hold it up to extinguish those flaming arrows that the evil one shoots at our minds and at our hearts? The idea of being a flaming arrow, the real danger is not the hole it, it leaves. It's the fire it ignites. And this amazing shield of faith allows us the faith to trust and obey what God says, allows us to have that flaming arrow, the flaming part, extinguished. Now we're going to be looking at a a character from the Old Testament named Joseph today. And if I were to describe Joseph's life, I would say he is a textbook case of a worst case scenario guy. Now it doesn't look this way at the beginning of his life. At the beginning of his life, he would say, man, this guy, he's the golden child. He's, part, he's got part of a family where there's 12 brothers and a sister. He's number 11 out of those 13 kids. And he is the dad's favorite kid. His dad's Jacob, and he just favors him. In fact, Jacob really plays the role of a, playing favorites all through. He had a favorite wife. He had favorite kids. A lot of destruction comes from this. But what you see is in Joseph, this actually leads to some problems. In fact, at one point, I would say to you that he really needed this book. Uh, When I was working at Eddie Bauer in college, they used to sell this book. It's called The Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook, and it is hilarious. The premise of it is they put you into situations and say, here's how to solve that problem. Situations that none of us would ever be in. Things like, how do you detect a bomb? How do you defuse a bomb? How do you jump from a moving train? How do you um, hack into a computer system? How do you run away from an alligator? Yeah, which you see on the cover right there. In fact, when... Times were slow at Eddie Bauer. I would go over and look at the book, which, because it was Eddie Bauer, it was all the time, which I should have had the entire book memorized. This is the kind of book that Joseph actually needed. He didn't know it starting out, but when he was about 17 years old, his mouth got the better of him because he had such a good life. He didn't think he needed to be careful with his mouth, and he shows himself to have a pretty low emotional intelligence at one point. God was going to use Joseph, and he gives him two dreams. One dream, he has... um, it's not a term we use a lot, but it's called the sheave of grain. When you pile up the, the, the grain and you put it into a bundle, that's called a sheave. And he had a, he had a vision, a dream, that his sheave grew really tall. And then all the other sheaves were his brothers, and they bowed down to him. And he had another one where his star got brighter, and all the other stars, his brothers, even the sun and the moon, his mom and dad, they all bowed down to him. And in his foolishness, he went to his family, I'm just guessing at breakfast or at dinner time, sat down with him and said, hey, guess what dream I had? Well, how do you think that went over? This guy's already the favorite. In fact, one of the things he's most famous for is that his dad gives him a coat of many colors, which you can get anywhere nowadays except Eddie Bauer. They don't sell stuff like that. But at almost any other place you go, you get a coat of many colors and it's no big deal. But back then, dye was a really expensive thing. And only one kid gets this really expensive coat, and it's, it's Joseph. So these brothers already have a problem with him. Listen to this dream that, that he has. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Now we have a problem. And so the brothers get together and they say, hey, uh, let's do something here. So they decide they're going to actually kill their little brother. And so they take him. And the first thing they do is they throw him into a cistern, which is like a big well. And then they're going to decide how they're going to do the deed. And uh, at one point, one of the brothers says, uh, hey, uh, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Instead, come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. Slight mode of conscience here. Let me just pause for a second. Our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. This is also, by the way, one of the first inclinations of capitalism that you see here, where they said, hey, let's make a little money off the guy. And you can imagine, this is the type of thing I am always thinking of when I'm trying to put myself into the story. Imagine the heartbreak that Joseph has as he's walking off. 
I wonder if he also said, 50 bucks? I'm worth more than that? Come on. As he's headed off to Egypt. But first thing that I want you to notice about Joseph in his life, in this worst case scenario life, is that Joseph was rejected. In fact, as you look at that idea of the worst case scenario, if he had bought that handbook, he probably should have come into Eddie Bauer and bought one of those because he definitely needed it. But you know what he wouldn't find in there? How do you get out of a cistern? How do you avoid your brothers who are trying to kill you? How do you avoid being sold to Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt? What do you do in situations like this? But I do want you to see this, that Joseph was rejected. I don't know what it felt like that moment. He was supposed to go out and see his brothers, and they grab him, and they throw him into the cistern. He knows there's a problem, and then he's sold. What does it feel like to be the guy who was never, in his mind, never going to see his dad again? His coat is gone. His hands are probably bound, and he is headed to a land he doesn't know, probably a language he doesn't speak. Everything in his world is just gone. And in the midst of that, you have to ask yourself, and who is it that did such a thing? It was his brothers. See, Joseph wasn't just rejected and sold. Joseph was betrayed. And in this close personal relationship that we have with family, one of the things that he felt as he walked off into a land that he did not know, he felt the break of relationship between he and his family. Not only that, he lost everything I was thinking about what this feels like in our day and age, and I don't know if you've, you're in the process of feeling rejected, but I know that you're, I would say for sure that all of you know what it feels like right now to have your world tipped upside down. And as Joseph was walking along, I wonder if it ever crossed, my, crossed his mind. When will things ever get back to normal? When will things be okay? Well, in the course of time, they never went back to normal. There was no normal. This was the new normal. That's one of the things I think is so amazing about Joseph is how he handled himself. When he gets to Egypt, the Lord is with him. It's funny how the Lord travels well. He didn't just stay in Canaan. The Lord walked with him all the way down to Egypt. And when he gets there, as a slave, he begins working and he works hard. And he sold to a guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar notices this guy has it all together and there's a blessing upon him. In fact, it says here, in chapter 39, uh, 4b, it says, Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned, because he was seeing the blessing. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. So picture this. Joseph sold, ends up in Egypt, bought by Potiphar, and God so blesses Joseph. Potiphar sees what's happening puts him in charge of everything, and because of Joseph, God is blessing everything. In fact, it says everything inside the house and all of the fields. Potiphar is doing well because of Joseph. But there's a problem. This time it's not betrayal. This time it's a personal attack. And it comes not from Potiphar. It doesn't come from his brothers. It comes from Potiphar's wife. In fact, it says that Joseph was well-built, and Potiphar's wife said, hmm, I want some of that. And there's Joseph, objectified. In fact, what she kept saying is, come sleep with me. And one time, this is, happens multiple times, and Joseph always refuses, and he refuses, he refuses. He says, why would I do such an evil thing? But at one point, she caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Look what he does when there's temptation. He runs out of the house. Look at his character. It comes shining through. This may be one of the things where it was attempted shortcut. Remember the idea that there's shortcut answers to have long-term consequences? He avoids this shortcut, but in the process, look what she does to him. You can tell she has no love for him. He is an object to her. And this is what she says. Look, she screams out as he leaves. She said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to, a, brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. She declares a falsehood. And says, look what this guy did. He deserves to die. Get him. And though he had done nothing wrong, he did everything right. But let me tell you something. When you do everything right, it does not guarantee that everything comes out all right. And so Joseph, after being rejected by his brothers and sold into slavery, Joseph ends up in prison. He went from being rejected to being trapped. I've never spent time in prison and I don't actually know what that really feels like. All of us think we can imagine, but, but I have a dear, dear friend who has spent time in prison. He spent 10 months in prison. 
And uh, yesterday I spent a little time with him, asking him and talking with him, what's it like in prison? And he said, one of the things that you'll need to know is that when you go to prison, everything is stripped away. Anything that you have built up relationally, everything you've built up financially, everything that you have built up, it's stripped away. But then he said this, but when it's all stripped away, all you have left is what you have with Jesus. And that's all you have. The other thing that he said is when you go to prison, it's very humbling. He said, I realized I'm not as important as I thought I was. So I don't know how this feels to you, but for some of you, I think that you're in a prison and you may not know it. In fact, I'd like to take this little motif of, I know he was falsely accused and he was put into prison. But I think some of us are in a prison and maybe what we have is we have a cell that's built from financial walls and we feel utterly trapped, just like Joseph. And others of us, because of the relational bars, we feel this isolation and we're in a cell of relational isolation and we feel trapped. But for others of us, we are shackled by the prison of bitterness. But for so many of us, we are caught. We are trapped. And we feel exactly what this feels like. And maybe we've even been falsely accused. Maybe our character has been assassinated and we sit in this isolation because of this difficulty. Here's what I, my question is. You can't help but ask the question, where was God on the day when Joseph walked up to his brothers and they took his coat, threw him into the cistern, and then sold him? And where was God when the lack of character from Potiphar's wife came against the character of Joseph and who wins? It appears that, that the, the one with no character wins. Where's God in moments like that? When you're thrown into a prison, whether it's financial or relational or it's an actual prison, where's God in those moments? I think sometimes it's tempting to ask about the bigness of God. Is God big enough for a moment? I actually wonder if the question might better be suited. Sometimes is God small enough to fit into my cell? We know that he can handle the big battlefield, but can he sit in a lonely cell where I'm all alone right now? And some of you feel that right now, that the COVID crisis, and you're asking a question that may be the exact same thing that young Joseph was asking. Are we going to be okay? Is this going to get back to normal? I'll tell you, your, your, your response to your circumstances will always reflect your connection with God. Let me say that again. Your reaction to your consequences will always reflect your connection with God. And I believe that in that moment, there was actually a beautiful communing with God as Joseph was in there. I want you to evaluate in your own life, what's going on inside of me as you're evaluating the prison of your life? We're going to have Amy share a song um, that just asks this question, God, are you small enough to fit into this difficult space? So just, I want you to contemplate what it is God is speaking to you. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. I hope that was a moment where you could pause for a second. By the way, that song's called Small Enough. It's by Nicole Nordeman if you want to look it up on YouTube and maybe meditate on it a little bit more later in the day. I was talking with a dear friend of mine, Pastor Jason, who was uh, in, a, in a moment of transition in his life where he and the family are moving from being a part of the green staff and now they're going to join the staff at South Umqua. He sees the new campus pastor in South Umqua. And he sat down with his family and talked with them about it hey, um, we're going to make a transition. We're no longer going to be student ministry pastor at Green. We're going to go down to Myrtle Creek and to South Umpqua. And one of the questions that came up from the kids was, are we going to have to move again? And moves are really traumatic. I don't know if you remember this, but when you're in a young elementary school, a move from your school is upending your entire world. And, and Jason said, yeah, we're, we're going to have to move. And, and Jason's oldest, Ember, asked one of those profound questions and it's, I love how young people have the courage to ask what all of us feel and think. She said, why does God ask us to do hard things? And maybe if you're in that prison, you're wondering, you're asking God that same question. Why are you asking us to do this hard thing? God, you have all the power in the world. Why did you let COVID-19 happen? God, you have all the power in the world. Why did you let the economy crash? God, you have all the power. In the, and maybe you're asking, why does God do hard things? My favorite part of that conversation between Jason and Ember is as they continue to talk about it, Ember still doesn't know. And maybe you're in that same place where you're wondering, 
that same question, and you still don't know, and you're in the middle of processing it. Before we were reflecting on that song, I, uh, I had made a statement that, that our response to our circumstances is in, is in direct correlation with our connectivity with, with God. And one of the things that I'm noticing is how Joseph responded when he was in prison. I think this is so powerful. In fact, in, in chapter 40, it talks about what life was like in prison. And just like it said with Potiphar, God blessed Joseph. God was with him. But one of the things that happened is there are two officials of Pharaoh who end up in prison with him. And they have a little conversation. But because Joseph had been so blessed, he had been put in charge of some things. And he was in charge of taking care of these two officials of Potiphar, uh, not of Potiphar, of Pharaoh. And uh, one day he goes to them, and this is what he says to them. Joseph came to them the next morning because they had had, each of them had had this really weird dream and it really messed with their hearts. And he saw that they were dejected. And he comes over and basically says, are you okay? And one of the things I think is funny is, you're in prison, of course they're dejected. But this is even more than normal prison dejected. Joseph says, something's wrong here. And he sees it. Here's what I've noticed. When I'm struggling because I'm in prison and all I can see is my own pain, the last thing I do is I look out and say, hey, are you okay? Look at the character of Joseph right here. This is so profound. And I have never seen this in the 800 times I've heard this story from the time I was a kid on. I'd never noticed this, that in the middle of prison, Joseph is caring for people. And this is what I think it reflects. I think it reflects that he sees that his circumstances are not what's true about God. The circumstances are just the circumstances. And his connection with God allows him to live this way, to care for people. How do you do that? I think it all comes down to, where are your eyes? And I think Joseph knows that God is right there with him. And in some ways, I've been asking myself this question. Am I just okay in the prison because Jesus is in the prison with me? When, like Daniel said, my friend, when all is stripped away and I'm just in here, when, when I'm humbled and it's just in this space, what do I do with it? I think his eyes are on the Father. Well, Dan, uh, Joseph sees this and he says, well, what are your dreams? And so the cupbearer and the baker share that they have a, um, a dream and each of them shares the dream and Joseph knows what the dream means because God is speaking to him and basically the baker's in for it and the cupbearer's gonna be restored and sure enough, the next day, the, uh, or three days later, the baker is killed, the cupbearer is brought back and restored and as the cupbearer is leaving, Joseph has this great moment where he says to him, so he asked Pharaoh's officials uh, who were in his custody with him in his master's house, um, why do you look so sad today? This is the part where he's asking and checking on them. But then it says, after all goes well with you to the cupbearer, when all goes well, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. He may be able to have a good heart in prison, but you know what uh, Joseph doesn't want? He doesn't want to stay here. Let's get out. And so he says that to him. And you think, man, how hopeful this must be for Joseph because the cupbearer of, he doesn't say this, but I'm guessing is just overjoyed with, thank you, thank you, you were so kind, thank you. And then he leaves and Joseph's waiting. And then Joseph's waiting first a day, then a week, then a month, then a year. And then after a year, it's actually two whole years, Joseph is forgotten and left in prison. When you're left in prison, it leaves you in a space where you really have to have lessons in disappointment because I bet his expectations were, I'm getting out of here. I was just a part of a miracle. I shared that miracle and told the guy, don't forget about me. And nothing happens. But in the course of time, two years later, two years later, let me say that again, Pharaoh has a bad dream and he doesn't know what it means. And the cupbearer hears about it and says, oh, oh, hey, I just remembered something. I was supposed to tell you this, but I just remembered. There's a guy who was in prison with me, and the story of how you got me out of prison, he's the one who interpreted. He knows how to do this. And this, I love the way they say this. He has the ability of the gods. It's just, just, you're just missed by one capital letter and one, uh, one little consonant at the end. It's, no, he has the power of God in him. And so Pharaoh calls for him, and there's this great moment where uh, you imagine in prison how you're going to smell and how you're going to look. And so they take Joseph out of prison. They shave him and clean him, give him a bath. And then they bring him before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh tells him the dream. And in the course of the dream, he finds out that for seven years, there's going to be amazing, amazing, amazing production from the fields. And then there's going to be seven years. You're not even going to be able to reap or sow. Don't even worry about it. 
And then Joseph says to Pharaoh, hey, it's your kingdom, but here's an idea. You might want to put someone in charge and take care of everything you can in those first seven years so that you have everything you need for the next seven years because this is going to be a problem in the last seven years. And I love this moment. Remember, so we have 17-year-old, coat of many colors, taken off, thrown into a cistern, sold to the Ishmaelites, sent to Egypt, sold to Potiphar, put into prison, and then now he's standing before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh goes, that's a good idea. Why don't you do it? Now he's governor. He's like the second highest person in the land. He was just in jail that morning. A shave, a shine, gets up in front of Pharaoh, and now he is the second most important person. And I want you to notice this. Yeah, Joseph was rejected, and Joseph was trapped. But I think all of that suffering may have actually been the very thing that leads him into impact. That it was through suffering that led him to impact, because you'll see this, that Joseph was redeemed. Now, once he's in charge of this, the first seven years go exactly as the dream had said. I was going to say as Joseph said, but I don't think it was Joseph. I think it was God who said it. Joseph just interpreted it. And for those seven years, Joseph said, we're building storehouses and we're keeping everything we can. I don't know that he did rations, but I pictured him putting everyone on rations for the first seven years so they could save everything and have it ready. Within two years, all the surrounding areas around Egypt were feeling the pinch, including... Ten brothers who were located in Canaan, and they ran out of food. So they have to make a decision. What are we going to do? And so they're sent to Egypt because the rumor gets out. Someone was really wise there because they've got plenty of grain in Egypt. Maybe we should go down there and check it out. And so this is what I, we're going to pick that up in, in chapter 42. So remember, who's the governor? Joseph, right. So here we go. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who was sold grain to all the people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. What an amazing moment. Remember this. Ten brothers threw him into a cistern and then sold him to the Ishmaelites. Before that, one of the reasons they did that is because there was a dream about a sheave and about ten other sheaves bowing down to him. Let me read it again. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Prophecy fulfilled. Taken care of. What does that feel like for Joseph? Because he sees them and recognizes them. He's dressed in Egyptian garb, and it's been approximately, we're guessing that he's about 30 now. It's been about 13 years. He does not look like that little snotty kid who came down, <laughs> hey, daddy wants you. He looks a lot different now, and they don't recognize him. So we have this moment. What do we do in this? If you're Joseph, you've had 13 years to meditate on this, to think about what does it feel like? What did it feel like when your hands were bound and he was walking into a land he didn't know to speak a language he didn't know as a slave? And who was the cause of it? And behold, they bowed down to him. What do you do in a moment like that? Well, of the course of... Of this time, at the beginning, Joseph just flat out messes with him. He calls them spies. Then he says, okay, maybe you're not spies. And then sends them on their way, lets them buy grain, puts all the money back in the bags, and adds a silver cup into their, um, into their bags. That night, they open it up, see the problem. They come back and they say, hey, what, what's going on? We don't know what's happening here. And in fact, there's a little conversation between them where Reuben says, um, yeah, I think this is because of what we did to our brother Joseph all those years ago. I think, this is funny, I think Reuben's saying, karma, dude, karma got us. We are trapped, and this is because of what we did. Well, Joseph hears this, and in fact, it says he has to run out and he weeps. In fact, in your devotions this week, uh, every one of them as you walking through these stories, here's what I want you to look for, especially when Joseph is connecting with his brothers. I want you to look at the emotion. I, I try to count it. I think it's something like six times you'll see weeping, because of the emotional damage done by rejection and by betrayal. And Joseph hears this, and he goes off and weeps, and he's brokenhearted. But over the course of time, he, he sends them back. They have to bring back a brother. In fact, he keeps Simeon and puts him in prison over the, just a long, long run here. And finally, Joseph is ready to make himself known after all of this. He's made his decision on how he's going to handle this. And listen to what it says. This is in chapter 45. This is what it says, starting in verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. 
And when they had done so, Joseph said to them, I'm going to burn your house down and cut you up and feed you to the alligators. You stinking... Wait, wrong page. Ah, here it is. Here it Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one that you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. And so his brothers were speechless. I don't know if you, you catch this, but all through, I think it's about three chapters, Joseph is wrestling with how he's going to respond to his brothers. At first, I thought he was just being a brother and messing with them. But I remember about a year ago being in a conversation with Pastor Ed about this conversation. And what he said to me was he thinks he's actually processing out what forgiveness really looks like. Because forgiveness isn't easy. And I think you actually have to practice forgiveness. But he's really actually wrestling with this. And he says to them, this was for good. This was for a good thing. God did this to protect you. In fact, this is saving you. What you did, which was evil, this doesn't make what you did right, but it is something that God is using. In fact, five chapters later, after the whole family is brought down, Jacob, who is still alive in Canaan, they bring him down to Egypt. And while he's there, there's this great time where the, the family is reconnected. But then when Jacob passes away, Joseph's brothers come to him and say, um, maybe you were only caring for us because of dad. And he says to them, or they say to him, hey, um, remember what dad said, don't, don't hold it against us. We're really, really sorry. And there's this wonderful thing. He reiterates a really similar thing that he says in, in chapter 45. This is what he says. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? I don't, just pause and catch that. He's standing there with the 10 people who betrayed him. And they're saying, are you going to get us back now? And he realizes, that's not my job. Whose job is that? It's God. Do you remember what we talked about when he was in prison? What was his view of God? What was his connection with God? He says, I'm not in the place of God. I don't, I don't play that role. I may have a lot of power in Egypt, but I don't have power over you. That's a relationship between you and God. I'm not in the place of God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. I said it before to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And I love it this time. He expands it. He says, not just you, not just you. Lots of people were saved because of your ill deed. God is bigger than your deed. Who's, who's the author of this story? It's bigger than you. In fact, in the next chapter, um, the author of Hebrews talks about the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that's the author. He's the one that's the story. He's the one who's, who's leading this. And I want you to notice this, that Joseph was rejected and Joseph was trapped. Joseph was redeemed. But more than anything in the process of all of it, I want you to see that Joseph is forgiving. The living out of a worst case scenario life, his response was a forgiving heart. And as I said earlier, I think forgiveness has to be practiced. Forgiveness is an unnatural act. No one comes out of the womb ready to just say, I forgive. It has to be taught, and then it has to be practiced. And I would say this, if you're not practicing forgiveness with the little things, it's going to be heartbreakingly hard with the big things. Forgiveness has to be practiced. And one of the things um, that I notice is I go back to Ember's story about saying, why does God ask us to do hard things? Sometimes the hard thing is to endure prison. There's no shortcut. Remember we talked about shortcut answers lead to long-term consequences? You can't get out of prison with a shortcut. But you can try and take a shortcut on this. And sometimes God asks us to go through hard things. And sometimes he asks us to do hard things. And I don't know if there's anything harder than this. Because someone owes me for the pain that they have caused. They owe me. So I want to talk through with you. How do you walk through this? I want to share with you a process for this that... You've probably heard here at Family Church many, many, many times, but we think it is so, so important. This is one of those things where the shield of faith takes so, is so important that the extinguishing the flaming arrow of bitterness, you will live and die based on this. Because what I've noticed is when you don't extinguish the flaming arrow of bitterness, it will confine your life. You will not be able to be in prison and be like Joseph and say, are you okay? 
No, because what happens is when you have a bitterness in you, your life will constrict and constrict and constrict and constrict. And if you can't show grace, you won't be able to show grace. And it won't just be to the person that hurt you, it will be to the people in your life and your life will get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I implore you, if you're ever gonna learn anything from Jesus, learn from what Jesus said while hanging on the cross, Father, forgive, forgive them. And the first step of this is that you make the choice to forgive. And this doesn't mean it ends. You don't just go, oh, I forgive you. Because you know what happens is you say, I forgive you. And then you're driving in your car the next day and it comes back up. And you remember but it has to begin with this. You know what the Bible doesn't say? It doesn't say when Joseph began this process. I sure wish I knew though. I wish I knew what was that moment when he began this thing where he said to his, about his 10 brothers, I forgive you. Was it already when he was walking down to Egypt? Was it when he was in that uh, prison and he was wrestling with all of this? He had a lot of time. Did he ever say, okay, God, I forgive them. Well, because this isn't the only part of it, you have to go through that forgiving where when it comes back up in the car and you're thinking of it or you're in the shower or you're doing your laundry and you're thinking about it or you're in front of them and you have to say again, forgive, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. This is why it's so critical to practice forgiveness on the small things. It doesn't just mean ignoring. It means actually forgiving along the way because when you practice it, it'll make this far more smooth. And then over the course of time, you'll find that the forgiving and the forgiving and the forgiving may actually lead to a moment where you can look them in the eye and say, you are forgiven. And perhaps what you meant for evil, God meant for good. But God sent me ahead of you to, to preserve a remnant on earth and save your lives by a great deliverance. Perhaps the very thing that happens here is because you're willing to do this it saves everything. You notice that prophecy said that the sheaves would, his sheep would rise up and theirs would bow down. The prophecy didn't say anything about how he would forgive them. The prophecy's fulfilled and he could kill them all and he still holds to, the, to that promise or at least to that vision. But God was doing something bigger. And because Joseph went through this, not only did it save lives, it put in him, it produced in him a fruit a beautiful echo out of his life that was bigger than just whether or not he had them bow down to him. He lived out something wonderful. I do want to have us do a little time where we're connecting with each other and, and kind of sharing what this looks like in our lives. But first, I just want to pray over us. I want to pray in two areas. I want to pray about those of you who are living in a prison right now, that you would handle that time well. And I want to pray for those of you who are wrestling with forgiveness that you would handle that time well, that you would process this in a godly way. We're not rushing you to forgive, but you need to be moving in forgiveness. Let me pray for us. God, first, I just lift up those of us who are living in a prison that could be financial, it could be relational, it could be that we're actually trapped in our home because of the COVID crisis. Or perhaps there's someone listening and you're actually headed into prison, an actual prison. God, I pray that as things are stripped away, you would help us have our eyes put towards you and humility. God, I pray that as those things are stripped away, we would see a greater truth, that we would see that we're not as important as we thought we were, that you were doing something bigger. God, I pray for those of us who, the prison that we're in is a, a prison of bitterness. God, I pray that you would release the shackles and you would begin us in the process of stepping towards the door of that cell, that we would say, I forgive. And when we take the next step of I forgive, I forgive, I forgive, and we would process that with the grace that you had on the cross, with the grace that we see in Joseph. And God, I pray that you would deliver us to that land of the forgiven, that we would live in the land of forgiven. As we've been forgiven, we would forgive others. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray, amen. Well, I'm not sure where you're watching this. Some of you I know are at some of our campuses and you are with a few other people in the room. Some of you are watching this at a group at home or perhaps you're sitting by yourself. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to spend some time evaluating this and then I want you to have a conversation about this. Maybe it's with the people where you are. Maybe it's just heading outside if you're at one of our campuses so you can take your masks off and have a little dialogue where you can talk through this. But I want you to, to talk today about this. I want you to share what makes forgiveness difficult. 
Is it because of the weight of the emotion? Is it because of your love of justice? What is it that makes forgiveness hard? It's hard for all of us. Share with each other what makes forgiveness so hard. I love you, and we will see you soon.